Hello, book clubbers. Doesn't it feel good to move, to dance a little bit? Hopefully you're doing it with us. I got to tell you, I needed it this morning. I'm a, I'm moving a little slow, so getting that boogie on helps me out. I'm Jeff Kanata. I'm here with Lana Bashinsky. Hi, Lana. Hello. Good morning. Honestly, I feel like I spent so much time with some of my favorite characters in these chapters that I'm all juiced up with my own goblin energy. So the dance was good, but mostly an outlet for, you know, me being what you're feeling inside. with the spirits of Curdle <laughs> <laughs> and Tellerized. <laughs> I love it. We're going to dive in. We got two chapters uh, this week, chapters three and four of the Bone Hunters. I always want to leave the the definite article off. I always want to leave the the off. And I but it's the Bone Hunters. Mm-hmm. And uh and we're gonna dive into it. But we always love to start the book club with a non-spoiler section where we talk about something that you can still hang out with us and chat about and get into, even if you're not caught up with the reading. And uh we got an awesome. Uh, interesting topic from a listener sent to us at dlcfeedback at gmail.com. You can also uh, send suggestions for non-spoiler topics uh, to the Discord. You can post them there on the Discord, which is 5 by 5 dlc on Discord. You can post them uh, on the YouTube comments. Wherever you'd like to do it, we'd love to get your suggestions for topics. And this one comes from Tickly Gonad. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Tickly Gonad sent this one in. I'm not going to judge. That's mm-hmm, the, it sounds mm-hmm, like a mm-hmm. uh, that sounds like a Malazan Medical army condition? name. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> or, or or that <laughs> either one. <laughs> uh, this uh, this email is a, a little long, but I'll, I'll read uh, most of it. It's uh, it's very nice. Um, uh, Tickly Gonad says, uh, "Good day. I hope you all are great. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for creating such wonderful content. Your show has become one of my most cherished weekly experiences." and is my go-to watch slash listen while suffering through insomnia. I read the Malazan Book of the Fallen in my 20s, worryingly a couple of decades ago now, and I'd forgotten how much I adored this incredible tale. So thank you again for reintroducing me to what I now feel is the greatest story ever told. I had the intention of reading with you through your beautiful book club journey, although I'm ashamed to say my voracious appetite for the story led to jumping ahead and completing the Erickson series. Uh, Maybe I should thank my insomnia for that. I feared reading ahead would reduce my enjoyment of your show, although it has had the opposite effect. Listening to the two of you share your insights and experiences has allowed me to consider important moments and story beats with hindsight, parsing my own contemplations and gaining a more thorough understanding of this beautiful series. I shall be eternally grateful to Steven Erickson for crafting such a masterpiece. His beautiful prose so wonderfully encapsulates human nature in all its tragic glory. It's a travesty these books aren't widely enough known to be held in the regard they should be, which leads me to my question. Apologies, it's taken so long to get here. I would love to see this story created in a more widely consumed medium, but feel the cost of doing it, uh, the cost of doing it justice would be prohibitive. Having seen how much AI generated video content has advanced in such a short space of time, do you think the use of AI generated movies will ever be considered acceptable? I'm of the opinion that it could create the most faithful adaptation of this series provided it had Stephen's involvement, which really excites me while also questioning the morality of it. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this topic. Kind of a, uh, kind of a tickly gonad, this, this topic. (laughs) (laughs) That's a, that's a spicy, uh, that's a spicy. Yes. I, uh, yes, it is one tickly gonad of a topic. Uh, And the first thing that comes to mind 
Well, there's a bunch of things that come to mind, but really it's that word, the the most faithful adaptation. Because for me, it's what is your definition of a faithful adaptation? Is Mm. it something that is word for word, the exact thing that you read in the novel? Or is it something that is repurposing the uh, the text of the book, the story, the experience you've had into something that is best suited for the new medium? Because I don't think those two things are the same. So for me, a very faithful adaptation is, is able to reach through and find the core heartbeat behind a thing and bring it forward and show parts of it because they can actually show you parts of it that are raw and emotional without needing the like uh, uh, the internal dialogue, which we get a lot in the book. Um, but I'll, I'll just sort of leave that as a, as a starting point because I think it's not not doable as far as creating medium if the, using sort of my ad- definition of what a faithful adaptation is, which is an adaptation. It is not going to be the exact same thing you experienced, but it will feel like it. Uh, yeah. So I want to start there and sort of see what your thoughts are on that, just as a s- starting point. <laughs> um, yeah, I think you know, adaptation is a tricky thing, right? Because the the word itself denotes some sort of uh, change, right? Adaptation means change, and I think that is inherent in the process of transferring something to a new medium is there is artistic interpretation. You are deciding what to keep in, what to leave out, how some, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words, right? No matter how beautiful and uh, evocative the prose or how detailed the description, it's, it's still going to be a costume designer that decides what fabric to use, how it falls, you know, the look of something, even if you are slavishly adherent to the the description in the text, there's still artistic in- interpretation. There's still some things that you have to figure out if you're changing it from one medium to another. So I, I, I think that artists, i.e. human beings, are inherent in that process and essential to that process. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they make great decisions. Sometimes they make decisions that I think are questionable. And sometimes it's a mix of the two, right? And so, but that's sort of the process of adaptation. And I think everybody wants a faith, quote unquote, faithful adaptation, but I don't even know what that means. You know, I think you want to feel the same feelings that you felt you like you want that feeling that you felt when you read something to translate into a visual medium or whatever other medium your you know, video game whatever it is you're transferring it to you want it, the feelings to be similar uh, or as close as possible but i don't think it's possible to create something that's a one to one you know I, I do and so bringing this back into the context of would ai be able to accomplish this Thinking about this adaptation and thinking about our experience with the book, so much of it does come from feelings. And whatever your feelings are about AI and its usefulness and where it might be in the world, it is not actually intelligent. It is (laughs) not artificial intelligence. It's not thinking. It does not know what you mean. So if you want a faithful adaptation and you want those feelings and even you want the textures of the material, if you plug that into AI, not only even if a person is sourcing then the clips or the images that are pulled from that, it's the human's eye that's able to tell that's closer to what I want. And the computer will just spit out what the internet thinks those words mean. And, and sort of try and put them together. What the scraping of images that they thought, the scraping right. of videos, it knows what pixel colors are supposed to go next to each other. But I think for the most part, it doesn't actually know what images it's even creating. It just knows right. other images that people have tagged with specific keywords. So uh, while AI, it seems like, oh, so fast to spit out a video. I think m- most recently, I think literally yesterday I saw that Toys R Us has made a commercial, the first Sora AI generated Toys R Us? Commercial. I thought they didn't exist anymore. I, th- I was just as surprised. Uh, <laughs> maybe it was some random person making a Toys R Us mm. commercial, but that's I didn't do, do, do that much research. I thought it looked terrible um, <laughs> because it's heartless. It's soulless. There yes. is no feeling. And even in the case of this commercial, you can see like cut lines and comp lines where the 
AI was not able to do a good enough job and they had to put something in that would get the right emotions. It is so uncanny and strange. And I know AI is sort of going exponentially and maybe it'll make a perfect thing someday, but it's still, I don't think, would ever live up to the faithful adaptation because Erickson's work is human. Yeah, It talks about this human experience and even with AI creating it, it takes humans to identify what makes the images created to be that right thing. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I agree hundred percent. I think that, as I said, what, what I, what I think people are looking for when they're fans of something in one medium and then are excited about it being transferred into another medium is, as I said, that feel the same feelings. I want it to evoke the same feelings. And that is, as you so rightly pointed out, the one thing that AI cannot account for. It, it, it is not, its metric in creating something is not feeling, right? It is not judging its output by the feelings it evokes. Now, humans can keep iterating and keep plugging stuff into the AI until it gets it right. And maybe as a tool, it will be useful in that regard for artists to shortcut certain things in certain ways. And I do think it's inevitable that at some point we're going to get to a place where the output is so, it, it, it loses a lot of the sticking points that you just talked about, which, mm -hmm. you know, that uncanny feeling. I think, I think it's going to improve to a point where it's going to be acceptable for a lot of people. And we are going to get to a point where people are just plugging things in and creating their own entertainment on their own. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, maybe for a, a lot of people, this, it will be acceptable enough, you and, know, and to that's... be like, Hey, I love something so much. I just want to see it. And the tools are so trivial to use that I mm -hmm. could just plug a chunk of text from my favorite book into the thing and look, it made a movie out of it. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where I would say the, it be, I'd be interested in what the definition of acceptable is. Is it just yeah. acceptable in like it visually looks what I wanted it to look like. For anybody who has maybe not been keeping up with AI or doesn't know that much about AI, just knows it makes pictures, images, text, like the energy required to yeah, support AI. Too. Yeah. Like, is it acceptable by way of the picture looks good enough? Maybe. Is it acceptable by way of what we must do as a society for the earth in order to support it? There are so many ethical, moral questions surrounding what AI is and how it's used that I am just, that will never be acceptable to me. Yeah. So that's, uh, I mean, and, that's, and that's a whole that's other, that's side, a whole of it. other that's, side of it, but that's, yeah. that's, there's so much wrapped into it. And that's why I think it's like, you know, a, a tickly gonad of a topic is that there's a lot of things and a lot of benefits AI can, AI, what people think of as AI can give. Uh, there's lots of tools that allow humans to do things faster, like genuinely, but yeah. I personally, hot take, just get and I'm feeling a little bit bitter that in the world where we would create artificial intelligence, the perfect world is that we would be able to make it do menial tasks, dangerous tasks, so that we can make art and live life yeah. and do the fun things. And instead, we're asking it to make art. So I'm like, no, never, never acceptable. But yeah. neutral take is people will accept it. Is that the right call? I don't think it'll be a great result no matter what. I read a really wonderful critique of, of the state of AI where somebody said uh, – you know, we thought that <laughs> we thought that AI would allow uh, artists to not have to worry about the the bland. You know, they, they it would do mm -hmm. the bland and boring stuff so artists could make art, and instead, it's doing the artistic stuff so bland and boring people can make art. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I thought was pretty, I'm doing it justice. Uh, I misquote it, but it's you know, you get the sense of it. I f the um, adaptation was. Right, I felt <laughs> I adapted it. I did <laughs> not well. Um, two more quick things on this, and then we'll move on. It, it, firstly, I am reminded of I think it was Cormac McCarthy, but I'm, it could have been somebody else. Um, asked in an interview, like, "Are you, you know, are you upset ab about, uh, you know, people ruining your books, you know, by turning them into movies?" He's like, "What are you talking about?" 
He's like, well, they take your books and they, you know, potentially ruin them. He's like, no, no, no. Look, my books are right there on the shelf. Yeah. Nobody can ruin them. They, they're they done. You can any you can always read them. They're there, which I think is a, a pretty healthy uh, way of looking at it. I don't know if Mr. Erickson would agree with that <laughs> with regard to uh, AI uh, <laughs> generation, but it is comforting to know that, uh, you know, the books are the books and and they can always be accessed in, in their, you know, purest form. That said, you know, I think one of the reasons people are excited about adaptations is that it brings people to the books, right? People mm-hmm. have, so many more people have read Game of Thrones because the TV show, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I do think that it's going, there's going to be a time when there isn't any beloved thing that someone doesn't plug into AI and have it make something else out of. I just yes. think that's going to be normal. And so hopefully that quote about, well, the books are still the books will, I mean, I feel like that's my only solace in that in that case is like, you still can read them, you know? Mm-hmm. Anyway, that's bleak, but uh, let's jump in. <laughs> really interesting topic. To yes. Go, thank Mad. you. Yes. Uh, very- you know, I, I want to say I, my, you know, spicy opinions about AI are are one thing, but the conversation must happen. And like, however yeah. anybody feels about it, you do you. I uh, I'm, I really appreciate you writing about it. I, I love talking about things that even are potentially contentious. So thank you. Thank yes. you so much. Please keep those comments coming. Keep the topics coming. We love being challenged to, to think about things in new ways, stuff that we wouldn't have come up with as a topic. So please. Keep sending them DLC feedback at gmail.com. All right, let's jump in. Spoilers starting now for chapter three and four of The Bone Hunters. We start chapter three uh, with Absalar and uh, Telerast and Kirtle, our, our new fun trio. I, I really enjoy hanging out with these three. Uh, uh, I love it. <laughs> I love it. They're it's very fun. Fun yeah. and like quick and like a very, I mean, we've had like a lot of like uh, sort of comedic moments between like little trios, these little pods of people, but like Absalar just being so like focused and serious while in the background, these two are like bickering is like, I like that it's an, another different flavor of levity in this world. And I just delight, delight. It's so great. Uh, and this scene is, uh, is pretty, pretty fun. It, uh, you know, Absalar is just like, I got to get out of here and walks out onto the roof uh, while um, Telerest and Kirtle are, are trying to decide what to possess. <laughs> Do we possess the chamber pot? Uh, that's terrible. Disgusting. Um, goes out on the roof, sits down, and all of a sudden, doo-loo, doo-loo, boink. Hey, you know, it's uh, Cotillion is there. Uh <laughs> I almost forgot my cotillion yeah. bamfing into existence. Uh, <laughs> <thing>. Bit. <laughs> you bit. Thank you. Um, anyway, they have a little uh, heart to heart where, um, you know, cotillion's like, hey, how did you do on that whole killing Mebra thing? And, and she's like, well, good news, bad news. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mebra's dead. Yes. I didn't do it. Um, and... Uh, there's, uh, you know, there's this I- insinuation that Telerest and Kirtle are working for Edgewalker. And uh, there's this strange moment where Absalar like caresses Cotillion's cheek. And there's like yeah. a, there's like a little, ooh, a little, little spark space. there. A little, Have ooh, you ever wanted little... to love yourself? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. The other thing I thought was uh interesting is uh, Cotillion ended up saying something like she said that they like are they to stand e or something he's like no but they just they were around those bodies so long that yeah. they took on certain elements of it and there's this interesting relationship between who the ghosts are versus who the bodies were and like what does that mean for them being together I don't know but a little mystery a little mystery yeah it's like if you uh you know if you spend too much time in Ireland you start talking with an Irish accent, you know? It's like that, but for dead bodies. <laughs> oh, classic, a classic. I, yeah, I'm right there. I'm right there. Um, <laughs> um, also, Cotillion says like, hey, be careful. They're just like Iskaral Pust. They're, 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 they're pretending to be idiots. And yeah. I was like, 
That's kind of the first time anybody has said pust is putting it on. You yeah. know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I thought that was interesting. And and that Tyler Eston Kirtle are putting it on. And it's like, they're it's disarming you with their stupidity. <laughs> they're yes. not actually stupid. Yeah. I like <laughs> that that was called out, especially because I think pust is an interesting example because it doesn't seem like he's hiding it seems like he's right. smart but then he just says all the inside thoughts on the outside of his body <laughs> right <laughs> which still might be the case but <laughs> yeah. also you know maybe like, all, the- like it really all is just a bit that's like he's so annoying you will just let him do anything to get him away from you <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah it is funny though like there's all it seems like so far there's only downside for Apslar even hanging out with these ghosts it's just like <laughs> yeah. what are you doing girl what are you even like like Everybody's like, I wouldn't trust them. They're not, they're, they're kind of lying to you and they're annoying. I wonder what she gets for it. Cause there's not been a time where she's like looked on and been like, at least they're entertaining. Like she's not really acknowledged them. She's <laughs> no. like, they're here now. This yeah. is my life. <laughs> yeah. This is, this is my life. This, this is really the, this is the burden I bear. Yeah. Um, Anyway, so then uh, she goes back in, into the room. The sun's coming up. They're freaking out. Sun, they hate it. <laughs> Very funny. Um, and she decides that she's going to go and uh, get some information, kind of find out about those those two uh, Grawl Purdue women that were, uh, you know, st- stalking her. Mm-hmm. She um, sneaks around, oh. eats some good food. You know, <laughs> <It's> <laughs> yeah, like- well, that's one of the things also that Cotillion's like, don't pursue what happened with Bebra. And she's yeah. like, I won't. Like, <laughs> yeah. Wink. Yeah. Definitely uh, am. She's like, I'm not going to. It's for, for a couple of days. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, she, yeah, she eats this delicious food. She's kind of spying on these uh, these red blade guards. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, everybody's excited about, you know, the molasses being back. It's funny. We're occupied again. Business is great. <laughs> yeah. Very funny. And uh, and then she comes back to the room, and <laughs> our ghosty friends are like, "Oh, you just missed this giant demon that was here." Well, but actually, at first, they, like it was a person. They said it was. A, 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 they're like, "Ah, not Absalar is here," and you can tell because she's got the iron in her moccasins, and she's like, right. "Okay, unlike the other woman." And they're like, she's like, another woman? They're like, no, 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 not a woman, a man. And they're like, okay. So they talk a little bit longer. She goes, so it's a man. They're like, yes, definitely. And she talks a little further and she's like, so it's not a man? And like, no, giant demon, actually, <laughs> hairy legs. <laughs> what? This is like, wh- which one of these is is the truth? Well, it's somewhere, I don't know. What's your thoughts? The, the way she reacts to it where she's like, all right, well, I'm going to bed. You know, yeah. It's like, I feel like she realizes it's all lies and nonsense. It's like, oh, I think, I don't even know if there was actually a person there. I suspect there was a person there, but the way she just dismisses it as being not something to worry about and realizes that there, there's no good information to be gained from these two wackos, you know? Yeah. It's, I don't it's know. just like this, uh, th- I think there's definitely somebody there. I don't know who it was and intended on being. I feel like it's one of those things that by the description of it, we should know for some reason, but I just do not. Mm. I think we'll find out more about, uh, clearly she's being watched, right? Because they had those two women watching her. So, you know, Mm -hmm. there's layers. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, All right. So um, then she wakes up and things get even weirder. Because she wakes up and she's like, oh, hey, time to leave the, oh, wait, what's this weird shadowy causeway that's now opened up? This, like, bridge this- that has opened up uh, out of my window that's from the shadow realm. And they're like, I guess that's fine. That guess seems normal. <laughs> yeah. I was like, you don't, like, look around and be like, hello, anybody Guess I'll follow this wherever it goes. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, but they were like, it was like in, it was there, but it was from the shadow realm. She was like in the shadow realm, kind of herself when she used it. Yeah. And then it went away, and then she was fully back, just in where she is. It was unclear to me because it like it looked, it felt like she was kind of like 
shifting into the shadow realm to walk on it. Yeah. Because only she could see it. And oh. they walk through this shadowy city, right? It's it's yeah. not the city they're actually in. In fact, it felt to me like we were looking at Midnight Tide stuff. I don't know if you got that impression too, because she's like, oh, there's canals, there's a domed palace, there's this body at the bottom of the canal. I'm like, and it's Tistaduri everywhere. And I was like, yeah. oh, are we looking at, you know- uh, Left, left, yeah, the Theris, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, uh, that was my thought as well, and then especially because she, but then she was like up, and then she like looked over, and she's like, There's Tisty Durr over there, yeah, and but they don't see her, yeah. But are they yeah. also, I picture her like up, I think it's described as kind of like an aqueduct almost that she's, yeah, yeah, through. like elevated platform, yeah. And then is she looking down? At like this fake, like, like, are they also up on an aqueduct or like, I couldn't exactly tell how she was seeing them. Yeah. All I know is that she was like, this is crazy. And then like hops out and then everything goes away. Right. Yeah. So I, I don't know what that was supposed to be, but it was a, an yeah. odd scene. Um, but the, but the, the fact that like I immediately, I mean, not just because there's Tistador there, but right. the canals, like the description. Yeah, of, there's of a the lake space. with ships. There's, yeah, yeah. there's a, a body at the bottom of the, it's like all of that stuff that seemed very familiar. Mm -hmm. Anyway, they arrive at uh, Jen Rob and um, they find Mebra who has been stripped naked and uh, someone has either been looking for something or hiding something in the room. Yeah, the Semp uh, assassin is gone. That's right. Yeah. And uh, then uh, Absar hides as the party women enter, and then she just takes them out. Boom, well, boom, boom, snapping elbows and knocking people out. Is that before or after the tablets? That's before the tablets. So okay. she knocks the women out, uh, you, you know, stabbing elbows and busting knocking heads. Knocking temples. And That's right. Yeah, yeah. And then <laughs> the... The uh, Teleros and Kirtle are like, oh, we want to possess one. Who gets to possess her? <laughs> Very funny. Um, and the other one, uh, so they possess one of the women. The other one she interrogates. And she admits that they're working for this person named Carpolen Demisand. Mm -hmm. Who it works for the, the TTG. Trigal the TTG. Big, big force in this book. Back, baby. Yeah, it seemed like a couple, uh, uh, you know, possible nasties. And then it's like, oh, wait, they're like friends, kind yeah. of. Uh, well, I, I like that we know that Mebra was actually killed by an assassin for the Nameless Ones. And mm -hmm. you sort of assume like, oh, that's all tied in. It's like, no, 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 there's a third party here. Yeah. The, the Trigal Trade Guild now is... In, interested, involved, just looking for information is what she determines. Yes. That they literally just came from, you know, they're taking a break, little, you know, a little R&R, &R, little, <laughs> little PT. They did after. some kind of dangerous delivery. I forget what they said that they delivered. It was Chain of Dog stuff. It was all the, the stuff to Coltane's that we saw in, the, in book two. Oh, yeah. And then they're on their way. They're on their way back from that. So they've already done yeah. that delivery. Right. And then they're back. And they also delivered altar stones to Egatan. That's, yeah, that's the one that I was thinking yeah. of. Was the altar Which we stones. find out later, like, people are staring at. Yeah. Um. Anyway, they're just looking to get information from Mebra because Mebra – Slimy, slimy fella. Uh, mm -hmm. Mebra's Play got every fingers side. and pies. Yeah. yeah. Just fingers and pies. You know, uh, not a, you know, not a, not a, not a person to trust, but a person to get information from. And um, so Abstar is like, oh, I'll, I'll give you a peace offering. Mebra was actually killed by a nameless one and then knocks her out and Curdle's like hey did you know did, did you ask about the all the tablets underneath the floor and she's like the what now yeah then this is where like these <laughs> what like knowing what Cotillion said about them and being like they're not helpful they're going to be little goblins at you don't yeah. trust them what is it i wonder what it serves them to have given her that information i don't think we know anything about their motivations yet yeah i think we're going to find out eventually but i think uh well, i just feel like something. yeah everything every like little breadcrumb that they point out that she misses yeah uh that that's what i'm going to be keeping in the back of my head is like what did that do for them nice i yeah. think that's smart 
anyway, these uh, these clay tablets that they uncover in this cache underneath the floor are just chock full of juicy info. Mm-hmm. They got names of people, people that might even be related to Quick Ben. Mm-hmm. There's a Delot in there. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, a Delot. And how delightful. Um, Delightful. I learned a lot about him. <laughs> uh, so, so we find out that um, uh, this Terralac V person that we've seen a couple of times, old uh, Spit Hair himself, old Grimo, old old hair product, um, <laughs> is is a secret dagger of the nameless ones. We find out that uh, he's the secretist dagger. Which, the, yes, which indeed. it felt funny to like read about, knowing that we've like spent a little teeny bit of time with him. Yeah. Being like, oh, he, here he is, the secretist dagger. <laughs> I met him. <laughs> I met him. I'm not that secret. Yeah. He's the grossest it's dagger, not, man. He is the nastiest dagger. <laughs> Uh, and we also kind of get like a recap of everything that happened with Duiker and Heberic and Kalam. And so the like he- Mebra has been keeping tabs. Mm-hmm. And uh, so they all want to, they all leave before the party women wake up. And then uh, Kirtle and Teleraster are like, we didn't say anything about the throne, right? Yes. that I, I, I think that was like on the walk over. But they said something about, like, as soon as they left, they were like, oh, we sensed a throne, a delicious throne. Somebody's sitting on it. Um, uh, so here's what I put together about that. And tell me if you, 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 I'm completely wrong. Is it felt like they were looking at... Uh, Midnight Tides. Right. Rhaegar, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, yes, 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 yes. I thought, I mean, anywhere between, it must right, be Rulad, him. I'm not Rulad. Rulad. I, I mean, I went, into, <laughs> I went into World of Warcraft for a second. Sorry. Rulad. Rulad. But the, the, yeah, the throne that Rulad is sitting on. Yes. But I could be completely wrong because we're all, we're worried about the shadow throne, the, the, you know, the, the throne from. Mm-hmm that everybody's hiding. So that may not be what it was, but that's what I immediately thought. That was thought my of. assumption as well. Well, I thought Rulad or whoever the king was, because I'm like, I don't know what era it is. It'd be silly for it to be like, oh yeah, the left the king who killed himself. Yeah. Uh, so Rulad, yes, definitely Midnight Tide's throne situation. But they leave and they're like, delicious throne, we sensed it. And she was like, can you tell me more about that? And they're like, what? Uh, what? We didn't say. And I she didn't was like, say anything. I'm going to remember and you are going to tell me. And they're like, hmm. <laughs> I don't, uh, where, who, shouldn't we, it's over. Yeah. Over, great. Yeah. All right. So then we go and we have some, uh, some really fun stuff with Karsa, Orlong, and Samar Dev. Uh, they have made it to uh, Ugarat and they, uh, they stand uh, in front of the, the Holy Falad, the ruler of Ugarat, and his army of dudes. Um, and uh, Karsa, like, <laughs> All the horses are spooked because of because of <laughs> havoc. Carson's horse, and he gets off his horse, and he's like, "Havoc, don't eat anything." <laughs> I love that. Like, what a, oh, no, what don't a kill anything. Yeah, says. don't kill. Yeah, uh, <laughs> so good. Um, and uh, they're like, "How? You know, what's he gonna do? How's he gonna get in?" And he just like walks over. They're like, oh, "Are you gonna talk to the the Malazans that are holed up inside this this keep?" And he so- just strolls over there. Here's something I should have. I meant to go back and check this morning, and I did not. What was the? Did, wasn't the last time that we saw Carsa? They like just barely made it into the city. Yeah. Why are they? Why are they here? Do, do we have context for like what he's doing to try and get in there, or is it just I'm, what we read? I honestly was going to ask you a similar question because I'm not certain why he wants to confront the Malazans at this point. I mean, I think the information is there. I just can't recall it. Did they say in the last chapter that the Malazans? Oh, they had talked in the chapter. If I now, now I'm saying this out loud, I think it's coming back to me. I'm pretty sure they're in the city, and they're like the Malazans are occupying everything, and they're like, "Oh yeah, where's the last time you saw a Malazan?" They're like, "Well, it's been a minute." Yeah, and he's like. Okay, but the Malazans you say are here. And he's like, they're good fighters. And I think he like compliments them in some way, but he's like, but I have been sort of like on Shaikh's side. Let's go. 
Let's go yeah. see what's up in the thing. Um, but he's like, I'll go find the Malazans and then sort of see what's up is, is the implication that was there. So this is the follow up to that where they said they're occupied, but haven't seen a Malazan actually in a long time. Okay. But they're still whining about them. I'll buy that. I just don't know what Kars is up to right now. I, I can't recall what, what his like Purposes. meta goal is. Yeah. I meant point. to look that up before yeah. we got in because it seemed important. <laughs> Somebody will let us know. I'm sure. Yeah. Um, so he is pretty awesome. I love how he just walks over. He's like, hmm, can't get in. It's a little taller than I am, even though I'm enormous. I'll just cobble together this little uh, st- step stairs system. And then everybody's like across watching him like, what's he doing? I don't know. And he he just stands up on these stones that he made into stairs, slams the flint sword into the doors and busts open. And they're like, did he just break through iron doors? <laughs> <laughs> that guy's amazing. Uh, so crazy. Like I- I'm watching it and they said, yeah, it's like, oh, there's metal work on the doors. And it's like, oh, there's metal work on the doors. But like, I don't actually get that they're fully iron until we get the reaction of being like, <laughs> that dude <laughs> that is, guy. we got to get him out of here. Yeah. I love that's the reaction is like, he- I don't want him here at so all. So cool. Yeah. To be somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> So he uh, he enters this uh, Moraval keep uh, past all the all the defense systems that uh, seem to be abandoned. We got you know arrow slits and boiling oil places, and he's like, oh, interesting, um, and uh, finds these giant spikes that look like they were there to pin something in place. Well, wasn't that down in the hole? I, I thought that was before the hole. I'm pretty sure he like walks in and he's like, here's like this dome. And there's like, he sees that the Malazans or somebody he assumes is the Malazans have been like around in the area. There's yeah. not like a ton of stuff, but there's enough that indications that they've been there. And then he's like, and they've clearly like dug a hole over here about as deep as you would think that it would go, but it, like down to like a more firmer dirt. But instead there was a second layer of like stone, like thin stonework, but strong stonework that they've opened and down there's like a hole underneath there to like another domed room. So then he goes down because he's like, it's stinky down there. And then he's like, oh yeah, this was the toilet for how <laughs> whoever was here, however long they've been here, disgusting. Yeah. And he slops down there. And I'm pretty sure the spikes were down there because that's where the fight happens. And then it's like the the spikes are roughly half again as tall as he was if he was yeah. going to like lie down and get spiked by it. And then this creature comes out and he's like, it's about half as tall again <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as I am. Yeah. Uh, but this sequence is awesome. I mean, it's a little poopy. There's a lot of poopy <laughs> in it. But fighting the poop pit is like a uh, very evocative uh, See, that's sequence. The, that's the AI adaptation of Bone Hunters. Find the poop pit. <laughs> Let's see that video. Do it. Knock yourself out, AI. Uh, <laughs> um, yes, I mean, this prolonged, intense, awesome battle. I love, I don't think we've seen so far in any of the novels a fight that has lasted this long, you know, it, it really ebbs and flows and there's so much detail. And it's this back and forth struggle. Mm-hmm. I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed how, uh, Erickson st- steps us through this, this fight and, you know, there's head butting and knocking and ripping into each other and talons are slicing and, Your and face it's like, is getting sliced off. And it, yeah, it's all this awesome stuff. And then like, he'll, you know, he'll be knocked away and it's like, okay, all right, was well, that that it? Okay, what, what's the and then it'll be the fight's back and it's like it, it mm-hmm. really felt so cinematic and so um that like the the pace of it was rad where it would have yeah. these ebbs and flows and these jolts of action and then there'd be like calm. He's like, okay, is he gone? He's not dead. Is he gone? No, he's not gone. You know, it's like yeah. it was so rad. And I also love that he's like. You know, his face has been sliced. He's been pierced. He's covered in the filth. I'm like, oh, the infection is going to be brutal, you know. Uh, uh, the thing you is, really run watch away. Out for sepsis. You got it. You got it. <laughs> That's what you get in the fight in the poop pit. Um, and the thing is, run away. And you'd be like, okay, he's going to take a breather. And he's like, 
where is it? Like just keeps yeah. chasing it down. It's a, uh, you know, it still shows that like warrior of uh, the Teblor that Karsa yeah. is going and finishing the job. There's like not a time where like there's breather moments. The pace is great, but in the end it's still Karsa driving forward and trying to get to oh, the yeah. end of this thing. It, it's, it's awesome. And, and then we, and the other cool conceit that Erickson uses that is so pleasurable to me. So satisfying is constantly cutting back outside and like, <laughs> yeah. did you guys hear that? Yeah, I haven't, that's some bad stuff that's happening uh, the, in there. The, what do the you think's Malazans going on? must, he must have made him really mad. <laughs> like they think he's in there fighting Malazans. Yeah. Was that a scream? Oh, the Malazans. Oh, I, bet he's, the Malazans. I bet he's just raping somebody right now. It's I like know. The, 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 <laughs> the, like, the thoughts of like, this guy's a jerk. I bet he's doing oh, horrible stuff in there. Uh, what I know what that sound is. That's not. It's so. Uh, it's I know so what the awesome. Teblor do. I know what the Teblor do. <laughs> he is a terrible person. Yeah. And they're all like, "Yes, sire, that's very true." He's he awful. Bad. I bet he's he doing bad. awful things in there. And the, just the, like the the juxtaposition between this like intense poop fight and the people outside being like, "I know exactly what's going on in there," you know. <laughs> and then. <laughs> And then uh, obviously when he stumbles out and just like him, they would be like, what, what happened? He's like, eh, it's nothing. It's not. A big deal. <laughs> Did you find any Malazans? No, not, not a one. No. Uh, so here's a question uh, because it got brought up and because I need a little refresher, this creature that he's fighting, we, is this a uh, could change my life? I don't think so. I don't the think so. I think it's tails- something else. This, the fact that they pointed out that it's like this reptilian thing with yeah. a stubby tail. I know that we have been introduced to the stubby tailed creature before. I mean, you I, might be right. I, it's I like, didn't think so. I think that it is some part of the Kachin Chamale people. Is it? It's not a matron. The matron was no. would have talked to him. But there's right. something having to do... With the short tail reptiles, that it was another thing I wanted to look at this morning. That I know, and then Ikarium and Mappo later to jump ahead are like, Are you sure it had a short tail? Yeah, no, the short tail thing is a big deal because that's the like offshoot that was going to rebel right before they got wiped out. Yes, right. That was a big, that was a, the short tail to long tail thing is a big deal. Mm-hmm. And you may be absolutely right that that's this cl- the clue that we're given that this is actually a uh, Kachinchamal, but. Doesn't I want to say that Carsa would be able to identify that? Does he not know what they look like? I don't know. I mean, he was in the mountains for a long time, and the only thing that he ever talked about was the children, aka the humans. Right. And so maybe not. I, maybe during their rule, they were just like really hanging in the mountain, and they're like, mm, they're cold blooded. They'll freeze if they come up here. Like whatever. I don't know. But uh, that was my right. impression. Yeah, it, it's very non-specific as to what uh, it's not identified as as a. He doesn't specific call thing, it but by maybe name, that's, but the the reptilian short tail. You may be right, and we certainly get a lot of dinosaur stuff in these in these chapters, mm-hmm. um, as we're about to find out with. Or I think it's next chapter. Anyway, so so if it is a good change, Molly, what would be the significance of it being strapped up down here? Well, it would mean that uh like I that that's like a question that I have. I don't know the answer. Like the Malazans yeah. were here, I guess. Did it kill all of them? It's I mean, why I think wouldn't it, killed it leave all the poop pit? Maybe maybe they in, uh, accidentally let it out, you know? Uh yeah. as they were trying to occupy that I mean, I think that's what happened regardless of what it is. Mm. Is that they were occupying this thing as, you know, occupying this keep. And they mm-hmm. accidentally let it out and it mm. murdered all of them. Yeah. Because we see the boots that have like bones sticking out oh, of them, yeah. you know? Yeah. Which I think is a clue that they were chomped, but you yeah. chomped. Makes sense. Um, anyway. Uh, all right. So next scene, uh, we check back in with Leo Man of the Flails and our boy Korab. Uh, and they're just hanging out. Just it, Korab's just loving his master, just loving his leader. Just like that guy's <laughs> the coolest. Uh, and... Uh, <laughs> And they have this revelation as to as to who Dasim Ultor is, where uh, Korab, you know, says this quote about Decembre, 
And uh, Leoman's like, yeah, you, na- you nailed it. Nailed it in one. He, Decimultor is Decembre, the Lord of Tragedy. He's ascended, which uh, yeah. is interesting. Because didn't we think we met Decimultor on that island? Yes. I so he, don't know. I, and he watched that, that one Edur guardian or whatever, or the Andy guardian, like die. And maybe he was like, mm, tragic. My little cheat sheet here says that um, basically the the book we did not read, Night of Knives, mm. uh, explains all of this. Is all of the Dasim Ultor mm. uh, surviving the assassination attempt from Lacine stuff? Mm, gotcha. But we did already suspect slash know that he had because of the island yeah. scene, right? Um. So when we had, I I just love Korab hanging out with Leo Man and just like eating worms that are Aww. pregnant. You know, it's so gross, but I fun. love a good pregnant worm. <laughs> He's just into it, <laughs> super into it. Um, Every scene of him just eating some disgusting critter, like, like what he ate the the poison tree poison dart frogs or whatever last time, yeah, yeah. and it was just like getting crazy high. I mean, like, I gotta lie down. <laughs> It's so funny too. He's like, "Oh yeah, this one has roe, so delicious." And then the end of the scene, he's like, "Oh, is the roe is, is bad uh, for my tummy toe." I feel so bad, and it was definitely the roe. It was the roe. It was my favorite part. Was the worst part. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, then we move over to check in with uh, the soldiers, uh, Fiddler Strings group, the uh, the army, uh, our long list of uh, characters there. Um, bottle and smiles and Korik and everybody. And uh, I think this is a really fascinating scene because we kind of learned that bottle, we've kind of gotten hints in the previous novels about bottle is, is special in certain ways. But I think this is the moment where I realized, Oh, bottle is being compared to quick Ben. Mm-hmm. Like bottle is being compared to what we have heard is the most powerful wizard in all about. the books. Yeah. Uh, which, fantastic, you know, a little bit of a confidence issue, perhaps, at his heart. Or maybe that's <laughs> yeah. another person being like, well, I'm not powerful. I just like lizards, you know, or whatever. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But him being like, Quickman, uh, sorry, Strings, Fiddler being like, Quickman is the most powerful dude, the most access to the most number of Warrens on Earth. I know where he got them skills from. And I was like, yeah, from possibly sucking up all the other mages' powers. And then he's like, he's the most powerful one, except maybe you. Yeah. And I'm like, did Bottle teach him then? Or like, Bottle no, wasn't no, I in think, the... <laughs> I don't think, you know, I think the quick band stuff we know is 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 accurate. But I think okay. he's just saying like, you know, Bottle learned from his grandmother this like older form of magic. That's what mm. my take is, is that quick, yeah, he's like, quick band's got access to the Warrens and... Bottle's like, I don't know anything about Warrens. I know about Holds. And it's yeah. like, oh, no, Holds predate Warrens. Holds is older, maybe m- more potent, more concentrated form of, of, mm. of the magic. And so he's, I think he, you know, he's sort of, and there's this notion that he's working outside of, uh, you know, anything where the Warrens don't work or are corrupted or have mm. problems. It doesn't affect Bottle because he's working with holds. a more ancient form of magic, a, a a more sort of primal spiritual magic. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so Fiddler's just commenting on the fact that he's like, I know how Quick Ben got his magic, but yeah. you have access to possibly even more different right. types of magic. Yes. Than he does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Great. But he's like so avoidant. And it's yeah. definitely like, other than, you know, when we're with uh, Kirtle and Telerast and they're being avoidant, it's like, he like it's a mischievous fun thing. And Bottle is just like, seems like a lack of eye contact and like avoidant in a way where I feel the frustration that Fiddler must feel. And Fiddler has like sort of rising anxiety through the scene of being like, what the heck is going on? You have to yeah. give me something. And in, well, in the I case of this th- scene, I can feel that tension more than I feel like Bottle's like a funny goblin man. No, I agree. I, I, I love the dynamic of the of this scene i felt it was so it was such a page turner because of fiddler's frustration Mm -hmm. and he's just like you just give me a straight answer 
Yeah. Just say it. You, ah, you know, and, and I, I thought that was such an awesome dynamic, but I think the, his, his reluctance, his avoidance, his, his, you know, dissembling is because isn't he being followed by an aerosol? Isn't he like, don't we know that he's being, he has this presence and he doesn't want anybody to know about it, but it's like whispering things to him and telling him. Mm. And that's, that, he, you know, he was the one who like, who's like, there's a bunch of axes in the field. Right. So he's like sensing things. I also, uh, he, uh, it seems like a possible distractiveness because he is like, as they're talking, like releasing another lizard to go listen to some things. Like right. it feels like his attention span is even split. So it's not, it's like him being avoidant, but also him being like, I hear what you're saying. We should go over there. No, another there. No, we shouldn't. Yes, we yeah. should. Oh, no, now we have to go over there. It's like right. he's sensing things. Things are happening to him in the background of every conversation he's happening or yeah. that he's having. I think that's true too. Yeah. Um, Really cool scene though. I, I loved that, that frustration and that, you know, just, and he's like, well, we, we, we can't do that. He's like, why not? Because he's like, you know, yeah. I, I love that. <laughs> it's, it, it made it very, um, as you said, the tension and the, my desire to keep reading. It was, yeah. it was, it was it's awesome. Very page turny, very page turny. In the end he goes and they're like, there's no another, they know that we're here, but they're, they're somewhere, they are at a war He's like, they're fine. Yeah. They're not fine. And then like just goes in and yanks him out from uh, what? They were in the uh, Hoods Warren? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I forget yeah. what, what they were. Oh, yeah. They were talking to their mom. They're talking to their mom. It's an amazing moment. It, this whole sequence just I thought was so rad <laughs> is that, yeah, they're like, we got to spy on Nil and Nether. They're like, they're in this uh, circle of stones. Should we walk in there? He's like, probably not probably not a good idea to step into the <laughs> circle of stones and he's like okay let's just you know watch them from here and then they're arguing this 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 crazy spirit being and they're like ah no that's that's terrible it lifts or you know lifts nether up and is and he's like, like what is it saying yeah and he's like oh it's telling the her she should have babies <laughs> <laughs> it's saying you got to get married and have babies and uh in general just to grow up yeah uh, and I was like, "Oh, dang! <laughs> Parents be parenting. I that was awesome. It's so awesome." Yeah. And then they leave, and they're like, "Okay, Nil and Nether are gonna like take a bit to stir. We gotta go." Why? I I agreed with their mom. <laughs> I know that was the best line. The best line. <laughs> but it's funny too because he's like, "We definitely shouldn't go into that circle of stones." And then he's like, "Hang on a second, I'm gonna go into those circle of stones." And he, <laughs> yeah. he walks in and he goes, and he walks in and vanished. At least that's what he thinks happened because. For him, he just showed up in the, in the shadow yeah. one or, yeah. or Hood's one, I should say. Yeah. Uh, very funny. I thought that was very funny. Um, but yeah, they you know they they say to Bottle that he rides life sparks. I was like, that's a thing. Oh, all right. Uh, what's Can't wait to hear spark? more about that. How do we ride one? How do you ride a life spark? Sounds like a, sounds like a blast. This um, uh, how is this jo- this uh, thing that feels like a joke conversation between a child and their mother going to turn into Nether's very very important child in the future? You know. Yes. yes. Uh, anyway, I, I love uh, like you said how it ended, and he's like, "We we got to leave." <laughs> like, I did the worst thing you could possibly do. I agreed with her mom. <laughs> yeah. Very funny. Um, so then we check in very briefly with uh, Kalam and Quick Ben and uh, Gessler and Stormy and Truth and that whole gang. Uh, and, uh, they are still trailing, uh, Leo man and, um, they're traveling via the Imperial Warren. And then all of a sudden there's like these shapes that appear behind them. It's dun, dun, da. Don't know what that is. Mm-hmm. It's scary. It's spooky. Intense. Spooky. Um, so that's the end of chapter three. Chapter four starts with our friends Mappo in Acarium. Um, you know, Mappo is worried as usual about Akarium remembering stuff. And they find this, uh, this strange chasm. And uh, Akarium's like, I want to explore. And, uh, and Mappa's like, you want to explore it, don't you? And Akarium's like, you know me so well. I wish you were a woman. <laughs> uh, very I love this, but I also feel like this is interesting because they're like, okay, let's go explore. I do know you really well. Um, but I also haven't seen this place before. Mappo, I believe, 
through this section is like, this is also new to me in a particular right. way. Right. Where yes, that which seems like- nothing has been new to him. Yeah. They've been traveling this world over and over again. And he's been like, I know what you're going to say, but honestly, me too. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Super cool. And we uh, descend into this lake of ice, uh, m- m- melted Omtos Falak ice. And uh, we enter into a science fiction novel for a little bit, mm-hmm. which I thought was super rad. Uh, all of a sudden, we're you know in this fantasy s- space for many, many books. And all of a sudden, now it's sci-fi a little bit. This may be- Alien tech, anti-grav <laughs> machines, just awesome. Nothing felt more- like a video game in my brain than these scenes in a, like a long yeah. time. Like, okay, we've got like battles and armies and stuff, but specifically like portal windows of I'm going through here and I'm coming out there and uh, somebody goes down into swims and like investigates, which gives us the clue to go through the next place into the next building. You just crawl across because the gravity is crazy. I'm like, I can see the mechanics. I can see, oh, I can so feel good. myself playing this, this part of the game. <laughs> That that it reminded me of that those sequences in Dead Space, the first Dead Space, when you would go out into the to the um, you know, uh, where there's no gravity, mm-hmm. and you just kind of have to float, float along, and there's stuff hovering in the air. Yeah. So cool, because uh, they find uh, this uh, Kachin Shamal in in s- some sort of pilot seat with these controls around it, and they're like, mm-hmm. let's go check this place out, and they, it, it's a sky keep. It's like the the you know giant sky fortresses that the Kachin Shamal used and we think is what um uh moonspawn is i yes. think is a sky yes. keep decommissioned yeah. sky keep or <laughs> taken over yeah. by Anamanda Ray commandeered yes and they have this awesome moment where they they come up to this you know this portal that's uh got you know no gravity on the other side and he he's like what a, should I stick my finger in? Maybe a, a part of my finger I don't care about. And he's like, are there any parts of your finger you don't care about? <laughs> so great. He just sticks his little knuckle in. He's like, oh, it got clean. Yeah. <laughs> he's like, well, if we go in there, is it going to clean us so good it's going to strip our clothes off? <laughs> how, how clean are we going to get? <laughs> like, how clean do I want to get? <laughs> yeah. I was like, in that moment, like, are they going to walk through and a car is going to be like, my brain's clean too and I remember everything. Oh, that's cool. I didn't even have that idea that's that's awesome uh but i like he throws a coin in it and it's this coin that's like ancient <laughs> uh throws the coin in it and then they finally go through and it's amazing anti-grav you know floating you can push off and and move through uh you know gravityless and, space but they do not they're like mm, let's use let's find some quarters there's gotta be yeah. another yeah. way <laughs> to do this yeah and they, you know, they find other uh, pilots and other of these mechanisms that Ikarium did not make. Um, just a really killer sequence. The visuals of the the place and and the platforms and the bridges mm-hmm. that are broken and like, why did they even need bridges if they have anti gravity? And I think we we have learned that they're they have a Warren that helped them control gravity. I think. Um, hmm. So I don't think it's purely technological, but there's some magic element to it as I well. Mean, but that would make sense for like, based upon the only sky keep that I think we've seen being yeah. uh, Animator Rake's commandeered sky keep. Yeah. Uh, it's like, it's a city and yeah. it's flying. It's like, it yeah. makes sense that there's some kind of magic at play. Right. Um the thing I liked is, you know, they end up like going through another portal and eventually finding their way to a bridge that actually gets them across to the center area they're trying to get. And they're like, mm, there is a handrail down here that we can crawl across. But first, yeah. Akariam just tries to walk across the bridge, but naturally, like just this push off of his footfall makes him like start sending him just into the center yeah. of this chamber, <laughs> which is like, yeah, it is dangerous. Because like if there's no gravity, you could just. Yeah get stuck there that you can't get out. You'll just be floating there until you die. It's uh, interesting. So cool. Uh, yes. And, you know, we did see the sky keeps in their full, well, almost full glory at the beginning, the prologue for midnight tides, we come in and they're all plummeting to the ground. Yes. From the end of that massive battle, mm-hmm. um, which was such a, the way that was described, by the way, was just so insane. Mm-hmm. Um, like this raining death from the sky. Very cool. 
Uh, okay, then we head over to Crocus. Uh, they have found this uh, domed monastery of Derek or Drek. Uh, they find all these dead bodies in there. Uh, the, they're melted. The vultures won't even approach them. So see, they, they, they said that he says it looks like they're melting. And then I think Gray Frog's like, ew, they're covered in worms. Like so many worms eating the bodies that it looks like they're this seething roy. Like, Ugh. so gross. Delightfully nasty. And then we get we get some insight as to what Crocus had been talking about last time we checked in where he was like, wow, Heberick is really lucid right now, but usually he's raving like a maniac. And then we get <laughs> yeah. the ravings of a maniac where Heberick is just like monologuing of this raving nonsense, uh, which I think if you parse it probably not- isn't nonsense at all. Yeah, well, I like that he's like, there it is. I told them and she came and it's gone now and she blah, blah, blah. So it's like yeah. somebody came through, killed everybody is sort of like what I was sort of reading into it. Yeah. Uh, and I, I forget now because it was sort of mad ramblings and I know it will become clear in time. Either she killed everybody or she was there and somebody came and killed everybody and took her. I forget exactly the ravings. But what I liked about this scene is before they actually go in, he like is like danger. <laughs> like says something about like what is beyond and you can tell he has some kind of sense and then crocus is like is there danger over there for us and he's like you think i have that skill <laughs> like oh sorry do i have that talent <laughs> like he like sasses him immediately yeah. crocus is like okay i'll just go look it's like <laughs> well you can sense everything that's in there you can't yeah. sense if it's gonna hurt okay whatever man and then like two scenes later he's like there beyond the goats Two goats, a donkey. It's like, you can sense you with that. that much. What a jerk. <laughs> yeah, total jerk. Well, he also is like, uh, you know, we should probably loot the bodies. And Crook is like, okay, I'm going to loot the bodies. He's like, you've become so callous that you could just loot the bodies. I can't, like, believe you, I can't believe you said yes to that. <laughs> I was just saying it as like a, a gag. And you actually yeah, are yeah. despicable. You, you have no feelings. <laughs> <laughs> Very funny. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we uh, switch over to Solara, uh, who is uh, hanging out with Felicity and the Younger. And uh, they're like, you know, what I really need is to just, uh, just smoke up. Just, just uh, <laughs> share, the, let's share that pipe because uh, uh, things are bad and uh, nobody ever took care of me. Uh, I like that she's like, oh, she's like, what? Like, you see me smoking a lot. And she's like, yeah, like, convinces me that i don't need water <laughs> and she's yeah. like could i try and she's like you want to try this one i got 12 more you want to smoke them all at the same time let's do it you want to start <laughs> yeah. smoking girl let's go <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah and we find out that gray fog has been singing to felison oh when she Kitty. wakes up from having nightmares he sings to her i'm like no oh, that's not nice. like that little that's buddy nice. little buddy wants um, to get his little bang on <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, uh, then we uh, we have this moment where Heberek, you know, classic jerk, then like does something nice to be slightly less jerkish. It tells Crocus <laughs> like, "Hey, you know what you are? You're a leader. You're you got you're you're a leader." And Crocus like, "Oh, stop making fun of me." He's like, "No, no, no. I'm being I'm not a jerk right now." Yeah, I think it's so interesting. I mean, this this happens twi- twice in like pretty quick succession that somebody points out Crocus's. Lead it. I, I feel like yeah. it was both of us so disrespectful calling him Crocus. <laughs> He's like, I'm Cutter now. And both of us are like, I'm sorry. I, you're right. I got to call him Cutter. <laughs> He'll always be Crocus to me, buddy. I know. A little croaky. Uh, but the thing that's interesting is I think Solara points it out. Like, He's like, you're great at leadership. He's like, fine, you do it. And yeah. it's like this little heartbreak of him. And then when he talks to Solara, Solara's like, you feel like doing great at this leadership thing. He's like, you can do it if you want. Somebody else can do it if they want. Yeah. I don't even want to do it. So Lara's immediately like, oh, so that's what happened between you and your lady. Is there's like a contention yeah. for who would lead. And you are a natural leader, but you were following, you were following her. It's that's like right. an interesting sort yeah. of piece to wrap up in that. I- exactly. Yes, very much so. Uh, but w- before that, we have this weird entrance of a brand new character, the Soldier of Hood, who is this uh, Segula that is doesn't like other Segula. Or <laughs> he's know, like, still... 
They're still doing that. Ugh, these idiots. He's like, uh, so he's like talkative and he's like, why did you send me here? I'm quit. I'm clearly on a mish and you're distracting me. And I was so close to the thing. And now I'm here. Yeah. Just, what? They're dead. You did it. And they're like, hey, man, what's up? And then they notice his mask and they're like, oh, my gosh, you're a sail and you're, you're talking to us. He's like, what do you mean? That's what, why wouldn't I talk to you? And it's like, well, we've heard. And he's like, oh, I can't believe they're still doing that. And so they, oh, that's so stupid. He's got like brain worms over there. God. And he's just like so annoyed. Every yeah. thing anybody says, like, this is so stupid. I got to go back on my journey. And then he just like pieces out. <laughs> he be, He's so ticked that he just forgets his spear and leaves without his yes. weapon. <laughs> well, he has a billion. He has ability yeah, weapons. Yeah, he, he like, has so many weapons that it's like it's it's ridiculous. Like it's ineffective. Yeah, it's just <laughs> yeah. too many weapons, man. Too many weapons. <laughs> Seems like there's like some kind of compensation for something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, pretty interesting that uh, Crocus now has this spear from the Soldier of Hood, which one would expect expect to be a pretty rad spear. You know. Uh yeah. It says something about the spear, like the. The point of the spear itself was like as long as a short sword is. It's uh, yeah, interesting. Pretty cool. Pretty sick. All right, then we're back to Mapo and Acarium uh, in the Sky Keep, and um, they uh, oh, the, but this is stuff we already covered. They they you know this is where they do the coin and they they float through the floaty float parts, and uh, they don't find any bodies, but uh, they find they do find a dragon. That's been crucified, basically, mm -hmm. uh, on this cruciform, like nailed to this cruciform uh, object. And Ikarim's like, I know that dragon. That, that's Sorit. Yeah. Uh, I know that guy. And he was a dragon of a Cir Cirque. Cirque. The, the, the <laughs> path of the sky. Yeah. He's like, ah. It's the, there's a warren of the sky. I'm like. Of all the Warrens, the Sky Warren feels like maybe the least powerful. <laughs> what does it do? It's lovely to stare at. But what if that's the Gravity Warren? It is the Gravity Warren. You're right. Oh. I'm just being cheeky. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, so back with Absalar, the ghosts uh, are uh, still lying about not seeing a throne. And... Um, <laughs> They're they're walking down this shadow ro road, and and she says like even Shadow Throne and Cotillion didn't control where this pathway is leading, which is like, mm -hmm. it, it, I assumed that they were kind of leading her somewhere to show her things, but she says explicitly no, that's not it. Yeah, and the the uh, Telerast and Kirtle are also like, ah, oh, look at all this <laughs> like garbage reminds us of home, and he's like, don't talk about home. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so um, they eventually reach the home of Urko Crust, a place we have been to before. Mm -hmm. uh, Urko is our friendly neighborhood paleontologist who's, <laughs> who's just got a hobby. You know, he's just, he, the guy needs hobbies. He's in his he's, retirement. He's got and He's a just hobby. doing his little mo his model making. Yeah. He does, you know, his, some, his therapist told him that's how he can work against the rage. Yeah. Uh, and so he's just making, building dinos, breaking yeah. walls and building walls. This is, <laughs> this is the dude whose punch is so powerful that it nearly knocked Karsa Orlong out. Um, but he, yeah, he's building, the, he's building his little uh, natural history museum, <laughs> <laughs> which is awesome. And I love how he's got the, the, the tiny versions of the T-Rex. Yeah. You know? And the and then uh, Curdle and Tellerest are like, oh, cool, and <laughs> jump into those. She's like, they're gonna they're gonna possess those things, and they're not gonna give it back. He's like, whatever. But then, in order for them to like find their balance, they have to like make it actually function. And he goes, oh my gosh, that makes what are the so things? much sense. Uh, I loved that. It was such a rad little detail of. It's just kind of sending up how science can't get things sometimes because he doesn't see the forest for the trees. It's like, mm -hmm. oh no, when you're inside it and you realize how you have to move, it's pretty obvious. It's like, oh, it, it was, it's worth all of this hassle just for that revelation. 
Yeah. Uh, Pretty cool. The, the other thing I like about this is, uh, you know, his sort of flexibility. He gets like this boost of like d- dopamine and seeing things working. And then he's suddenly like, ah, fine, whatever, whatever. What is it you want? Sure. Great. Now get out. Yeah. Kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I also like that, you know, Absolar shows up and he's like, oh, I've just brewed some amazing tea. And it's like, <laughs> no, just poison that's going to mess her up. And then he's yeah. like, oh, right. Sorry, 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 sorry. I actually do care about what you want to say and like fix it, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very funny scene too because she's like, well, you, 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 and she can't, she can't talk. <laughs> And, and he's like, oh, okay, I'll give you the antidote to the antidote. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so funny. The, um, um, uh, and then the other detail that is interesting is, you know, we've heard Urko and like, oh, he pretended to drown. But this is, I think, the first time that he, it was stated that, oh, the whole crew, it was like their inside joke, we're all going to drown. Wink. Yeah. And so right. it wasn't just that Urko actually survived and didn't drown. It's that nobody drowned. Right. Nobody right. drowned. Well, we know that about Cartheron too, his brother Cartheron Crust. Yes. And we, we met Cartheron, the, and they both worked for Admiral Nock. Mm-hmm. I remember. And that was the whole thing about that. Anyway, uh, this ends with uh, Absalar realizing that what Cotillion wanted to remind Urko was to be mindful about what you're asking for, which I thought was very mysterious and interesting. <sighs> It's also, is this very interesting that those are all sort of revelations that Urko is having just from seeing her, like just yeah. the fact that she exists and uh, her mannerisms are so much like Cotillion that it's enough. Yeah. And then he does the rest of the work there. And she's like, anyway, that thanks was for rad. the tea. <laughs> she's like, you stand like him. Are you his daughter? Yeah. You know? That's cool. Yeah. It's like, well, not exactly. <laughs> um <laughs> uh, that would make the caress from earlier way weirder. <laughs> and she's also certain that he's going to keep his word, that Cotillion is going to uh, – is a man of his word or oh, a yeah, god she, of his word. She gets that from Urko. She's like, he says he's going to yeah. release me. I don't know if I believe it. Urko's like, you can believe that. That's for sure. Yeah. All right. Then we uh, we hop over to Terralac Vid, uh, who still just can't Spit get that piece there. of hair down. Just can't. <laughs> it's – it's a pesky little <laughs> cowlick he's got right there. So he uses a cowlick. Um, and he's uh, he's following the gym. He's following the gym Nabral <laughs> on the trail, on the on the case uh, of the uh, divers. Now this is and, our, um, our secret sword. The secret sword. Secret That's sword. Right. Uh, and, uh, you know, if... Uh, Pasting your hair down with your own saliva wasn't bad enough. Uh, he also uh, drinks his own urine. So there's that. You got to do I know. I've seen Bear Grylls do it. So, you know. No. You got to do what you got to do. No fluid wasted is Terlac Vid's. That's desert power. They haven't, <laughs> got, the, power. They haven't got the still suits That's right. yet. <laughs> it's desert power. That's right. Uh, anyway, brief little moment there. We just kind of like checking in. He's still on the trail. Mm-hmm. Drinking pee. <laughs> <laughs> Just want to emphasize again, really gross. <laughs> All right, next scene. <laughs> Speaking of gross, we then cut right to Solara vomiting in the sand and Grey Frog like burying it like, it's okay, I got this. It's okay, girl. It's okay. You, our, our little secret. Still, a little secret. The morning sickness. Uh, and then this is what that moment you talked about earlier where she talks to Crocus and she's like, she she kind of gets his vibe, understand what, what's going on with him. And then also, like, I could see something happening hmm. with you. And I know F- Felicity and the Younger likes you too, but that's no problem. We could be a thruple. <laughs> we can share Z's. And he's we like, she's barely legal. And so, but, and it's interesting because he is like tripping over his words and stuff. The implicate, I, it's like he's clumsy about it in a particular way. And, you know, he's still like, absolutely, my true love, but also. Yeah. Even Grey Frog's like, voluptuous babe. <laughs> yes. He's like, you must uh, plant your seed before another male comes. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. And, uh, <laughs> and it's interesting also like Grey Frog sort of building this trust again. You know, we heard about him singing to Felicity when she wakes up with her nightmares uh, and the fact that he's keeping Solara's secret. 
they're like both horrified by him eating the brains of things and being like, he is a demon, but he is, he seems like a pretty nice little demon, buddy. Yeah. But he's our demon. He's you know? our demon. Yeah. So then we, uh, we head over to Leo men of the flails. Uh, they've arrived at, uh, Yigatan. Yigatan? Is that how I should pronounce that? Yigatan? Yigatan? I would say Yigatan, yeah. Yigatan? Uh, and they have a meeting with uh, the leader, the Falad, uh, Vedor. Vedor. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's like, hey, um, can I come in? And the guy's like, I don't know. Slash your throat! <laughs> Slash! <laughs> Uh, it seemed a very abrupt. Though I feel like you maybe could have tried a little harder to make friends, but you know, not interested. You know, he, he just he he clearly seemed a little out of it himself. <clears throat> I think it implied that he was, uh, yeah. you know, yeah. in, indulging, right, uh, yeah. in some kind of substance that I don't recall. And yeah, it was a new. I think it was a new kind of substance that we hadn't heard about before. Yeah. But yes, and uh, Liam <laughs> just beheads the dude, and then this this. This Captain Dunsparrow rides up <laughs> and he's like, uh, she's like, ah, what? You want me to take care of that body for you? Yeah. <laughs> and like, Korab's like, you're Malazan. And she's like, so? What, what of, of it? it? Yeah. And then she and just like, like rides <laughs> away with a headless corpse and just kicks it over. Like, yeah. <laughs> I'm following you now. Yeah. He makes her his, the third in command. Cleveland's like, knock, knock. Behedron. Bedroom who? Bedroom you? Slice. Let's go. New team. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't play along. I didn't play along. I was. I was like, "What? What are you doing?" We got there. Yeah. We got there. Somebody got in their there. head said, "Who's there?" Did we just do two weeks in a row with a knock knock joke on the show? <laughs> now that's going to have to be a thing. We're going to have no, to do a knock knock no, joke no, I'm every not week. Signing us up for it. I'm not uh, signing you us did up it. for it. Hey, <laughs> one time's a fluke. Two's a trend. Three's a problem. But. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right that so that's the end of uh end of chapter four is um now uh dun sparrow is leoman's third in command leoman has arrived at egotan and has be assumed leadership of the city i'm the, i rule this place now cut his head it, it was an amazing scene where he slices the head off and no one reacts like all the people are like yeah that guy had it coming was like I the guess vibe you're I got. the leader now. <laughs> I have no other opinions. <laughs> uh, yeah. So we know that uh, who folks were trying to get there before him, and I guess they have not. Yes, I was trying to because I was like, where, where is Absalar again in the world? Uh, well, she is. She was, you know, traveling by Shadow Warren, so walking, she's wandering around, walking around. Because I was like, yeah. "Where is, where is everybody?" I was like trying to get like the place. But it's uh, isn't it Kalam and Quickban and and Gessler and Stormy and that group that is all trying to get to Egitan before yes. Leoman, right? Yeah, they're that they're traveling by Imperial Warren to try to get there first. It sounds mm -hmm. like they didn't. And also, the last time we saw them, which was Chapter Three, big things appeared behind them. So it feels mm -hmm. like oh, they're waylaid. They got obstacles to deal yeah. with. And then uh, the yeah they're trying to get there before, and then you know strings and crew, they're they're chasing they're on them. The so they're like yeah yeah. So it does feel like Etan is going to be a thing, a spot, and they recognize I think it's Bottle even, or or maybe it's Smiles who's like this guy's taking us to Egotan. Ugh, he's they're like immediately annoyed by that, and I yeah. think perhaps it's because they recognize that it, the same thing that Leoman does, and that it's a very defensible position. Right. Um, and I think everybody's just like, why is he drawing this out? Just let us kill you all. <laughs> it feels right. like the mood from the Molassans. Interesting. I, you know, four chapters in, I'm not really sure where we're headed. What's, what's happened. There's a lot of percolating, interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. A lot of our friends doing things, but I'm not sure where, you know, what, what our big crisis is going to be for this book. What our central, you know plot line is going to be mm -hmm. but i'm intrigued i'm into it me too enjoying it we do have some uh favorite passages i think i just have one this week but it's a fun one i actually think i only have two but i think they're all my favorite sections are not like poetic they are yeah. goblin delight um, i agree <laughs> 
Do yeah. you want to start? Uh, or shall I? Sh- you start because you only have one. So I okay, always- here I go. <laughs> I think you're going to recognize what this is right away, but it tickled me to no end. Toblakai had appeared, climbing down from the ledge, back onto the makeshift steps. Samar Dev and Inishan made their way to the moat, arriving in time to see him emerge. The bear fur was in ribbons, dark with blood. He had tied a strip of cloth about his head, holding the skin in place over one temple. Most of his upper clothing had been torn away, revealing countless gouges and puncture wounds. And he was covered in shit. From the flawed, twenty paces behind them, came a querulous inquiry. Toblakai! The negotiations went well? <laughs> in a low voice, Inishan said, No Malazans left, I take it? Karsa Orlong scowled. Didn't see any, he strode past them. Turning, Samar Dev flinched at the horror of the warrior's ravaged back. What happened in there, she demanded. A shrug that jostled the slung stone sword. Nothing important, witch. (laughs) Ah, beautiful. So good. He literally (sighs) is thrashed, covered in feces. What happened in there? Nothing. (laughs) That's the coolest. Oh, I love it. Uh, so I have one that's funny and then one that I liked, uh, that is le- less of the, the funny thing. It's a, they're both a little bit longer, so bear with me. Uh, this is Korab. A smudge of light to the far south, like a cluster of dying stars on the horizon marked the city of Kayum. The dust of the storm a week past had settled and the night sky was bright with the twin sweeps of the roads of the abyss. They were scholars, Cora Belain Thenulas had heard, who asserted that those broad roads were nothing more than stars, crowded in multitudes beyond counting. But Koreb knew that was folly. They could be naught but celestial roads, the paths walked by the dragons of the deep, and elder gods and the blacksmiths with suns for eyes who hammered stars into life. And the worlds spinning round those stars were simply dross, cast-offs from the forges, pale and smudged on which crawled creatures preening with conceit. Preening with conceit. An old seer had told him that once, and for some reason the phrase, phrase lodged in Korab's mind, allowing him to pull it free every now and then to play with. His inner eye bright with shining wonder. People did that, yes. He'd seen them again and again, like birds, obsessed with self-importance, thinking themselves tall, as tall as the night sky. That seer had been a genius to have seen so clearly and to manage so much in three simple words. Love that sequence. I love that section. It's so good. And and it it continues Korab's like, man, smart people are smart. I like smart people. You know, I love his admiration for for that it's so cool it's so cool and like uh you know like he has like belief there's like he just has like kind of hope and like the positivity of somebody whose uh perspective of the world is that it is kind of magical and unknowable in a way that leads him to like letting himself sort of sit back and just follow with trust yeah. Uh, it's, like. it's ignorance is bliss, right? Yes. He's like, he's ignorance is bliss. I also like, you know, we've, we've, we've had these, these little inklings of this sort of cosmic layer to the novels where you remember when Heberic was tripping balls and like had the revelation that, oh, every, every one of these stars is its own sun and there's planets mm-hmm. around them. And I feel like that's kind of this too, where Korab is having the opposite thing where Leo man is like, no dude, they're, they're stars. And he's like, no, no, no. It's a road. A magical <laughs> For road the of light. Dragons in the sky. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, I like that. Yeah. So the other piece I like <laughs> is uh this is Absalar with uh who she just walked along the this bridge thing, the shadow. Yeah. Yeah. The thread of shadow felt wrong, she said. Oh, yes, Tellerus replied, slipping around to crouch before her in a miasma of swirling gray. It's sickly. All the outer reaches are poisoned, rotting with chaos. We blame Shadowthrone. Shadowthrone? Why? Why not? We hate him. 
And that is sufficient reason? The sufficientest reason of all. <laughs> Absolar studied the climbing track. I think we're close. Good. Excellent. I'm frightened. Let's stop here. Let's go back now. <laughs> Stepping through the ghost, Absalar began ascent. Well, that was a vicious thing to do, Telerast hissed behind her. If I possessed you, I wouldn't do that to me. Not even to Curdle, I wouldn't. Well, maybe if I was mad. You're not mad at me, are you? Please don't be mad at me. I'll do anything you ask until you're dead. And then I'll dance on your stinking, bloated corpse because that's what you would want me to do, isn't it? I would if I was you and you were dead and I lingered long enough to dance on you, which I would do. <laughs> it's so good. It's so good. If I possessed you, I wouldn't do that to me. It's so great. And the sufficientest of all is mm. a great line. It's mm. the sufficientest of all reasons. <laughs> so good. Ah, I could I could have pulled any of the scenes with those guys from those two, these two chapters and been like, yeah, these are my favorite parts. Undeniably delightful. my favorite parts. They are delightful. I do, when we when we eventually find out that they're like uber powerful, <laughs> it's yeah. going to be, you know, uh, which is inevitable, yeah. I think. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So good. <laughs> All right, folks. Uh, I didn't look to see how many chapters we're doing next week. I think it's another two. I think it's always two. two, except for there's one week that's three, which could be this one, but I'm pretty sure it's not. Great. Great. <laughs> well, uh, that will be uh, that will be five and six for next week. I hope you're reading along. Hope you're enjoying things. We appreciate it. Again, don't hesitate to send topics for the show. Comments or questions are always welcome. We love hanging out with you. Thanks for being with us. See you next time. When the world's too dark of a place to be And you need an escape from reality Open up those pages It's our cry or fantasy Whatever genre you please And join a book club Cause you won't read it on your own Join a book club So you'll be held accountable It's just some means to an end But you're doing it